Hey everybody, Grommels here with my second Steel Armor Place of War video. A tank sim I have played quite a bit as of late. And as I've promised, this time I want to take a look and introduce the M60A1, since I have taken a look at the T62 and the game in general in the last one. So, let's go over some of the M60's history and characteristics and the differences to the T62. Since I have already given a basic introduction to the game, I will focus more on the tank this time. Now, by the mid to late 50s, the US Army was already working on a successor to the M48 Patton, which was the medium tank in service at the time. That prototype was the T95 medium tank, which incorporated many at the time new and often unproven technologies into its design, like early composite armor, a new smoothbore gun or a rangefinder which used reflections of emitted infrared light, somewhat similar to a modern laser rangefinder, though much less capable. However, those ambitious new technologies also meant that the development of the tank was slow and expensive. With the chance to take a closer look at the T-55 during the Hungarian Revolution in 1956 and the rumors of a new Soviet tank with a larger 150mm smoothbore gun in development, which would turn out to be the T-62, which I have taken a look at in the last video, it became clear that a tank to meet those would be required sooner and despite of the fact if the T-95 would eventually lead to a production tank or not. A few options were considered to achieve this and the one chosen was to improve the M48 Batman design, especially its firepower, as an interim solution till a more sophisticated main battle tank was available. And speaking of main battle tanks, another change made at this time was to change from a system of having a light, a medium and a heavy tank to one of having a light tank for reconnaissance and airborne operations and a main battle tank which would take the job of a medium and a heavy tank, making the M60 the first main battle tank in US service, while the M48 was still designated a medium tank. Now, as I have said, the M60 was supposed to be only an interim solution, but as is often the case, the programs that were meant to produce a more capable tank, the T-95 program at first and a few years later the joint German and US MPT-70 program failed to lead to an actual production of tank. So the M60 was not surpassed by a better tank in US service till the introduction of the M1 Abrams in the 80s. The original M60 still had the turret very similar to that of the M48, but with the typical Commander's Cabola of the M60 and of course the 105mm M68 gun, a licensed production version of the famous L7. With that M48 turret, the original M60 looked a lot like the M48 and they can easily be mistaken for each other. The hull front of the M60 is flat however instead of the slightly curved front of the M48, one way to keep them apart easily. That is because the M60 was initially intended to have the silicious core armor that was tested on the T95, an early type of composite armor. This was dropped because of cost and production problems though, so the M60 does have normal steel armor. This original M60 was pretty quickly replaced in production by the M60A1, which added a new turret developed from one of the later T95 prototypes, but also without the silicious core armor. It still had a shape that offered better protection than the M48 turret though. The armor of the M60 was increased in general with the A1 and its night fighting capabilities improved as well as a few other improvements. This is the version we have in game and was the most common variant of the tank. Since the tank was in service for a lot longer than intended, more versions like the unsuccessful A2 and the improved A3 followed, but since the game simulates the M60A1 I won't go into those later variants. Now, unlike the T-62, the M60 is equipped with a rangefinder, a coincidence type, as well as a ballistic computer to handle the correct gun elevation, making first round hits a lot easier, especially in long range, and with lower muscle velocity ammo, which is nice since you can use the heat rounds more often, which are stronger than the early APDS rounds available, but also slower, so getting the range and gun elevation right matters more on them. The ballistic computer, however, will only handle gun elevation, not the lead you have to give to hit a moving target, like a modern system would. You still have to do that on your own. However, it is not all good news on the technology front. While the M60 has a rangefinder and a ballistic computer the T62 is lacking, the M60A1 does not have a gun stabilizer, so it needs to stop in order to fire accurately. Now, a add-on gun stabilizing system was available as an upgrade for the M60A1 from the early 70s onwards, but the tanks in the conflicts modeled in steel armor did not have them, 
so you have to do without gun stabilization. The gun itself is as mentioned the 105mm M68, a version of the L7 and a rifled gun in comparison to the smooth bore of the T62. As for ammunition options for the M60A1 in steel armor, you have for anti-tank work two rounds to choose from, a armor-piercing discarding saber round, which is however not as capable as the thin stabilized variants which were available later for the gun. The other being a heat round, which has a higher penetration but is also slower, so harder to hit. For soft targets you have a high explosive plastic round, also known as high explosive squash at or hash. Originally developed for destruction or fortification, this type of round also proved useful versus armor, so it is a nice multi-purpose round effective against both light armor as well as unarmored targets. And as extra, there is also a canister shot, basically a large shotgun blast to be used against infantry as well as a smoke round. Well, since I just mentioned that the L7 105mm gun has a rifled barrel using that rifling to force the projectile to spin in order to stabilize it in flight, while the T62's 115mm is a smoothbore gun using fins on the projectiles to make them fly straight, I thought I'd also take this opportunity to discuss some of the differences and why most modern tanks use smoothbore guns today. This is an often discussed topic among people interested in tanks, with lots of different opinions out there depending on who you ask. Now, one reason for having a smoothbore gun is as often cost considerations, with a smoothbore barrel being both cheaper to produce and lasting longer as there is no rifling to wear out. The cost of the ammunition is a different story and I have interestingly seen both proponents of rifled barrels as well as smoothbore claim that their ammo is cheaper, and there is a reason for that, it simply depends on what type of round we are talking about. Now, Comparing the plus points of the two, the rifled barreled guns have the advantage that spin-stabilized projectiles generally are considered to be more accurate than their fin-stabilized counterparts, especially on long range. Also, since a projectile that is stabilized by spinning does not need fins at all, it can be simpler in construction and therefore cheaper. And if you don't have to fit a tail boom with fins on it into the case of the projectile, you have more space for propellant and filler though you also need a bit more propellant to counter the friction from the projectile being pressed into the rifling. Hash rounds also work better when they spin quickly, since it helps the creation of the explosive body they rely upon to work. On the other side, however, if you fire a projectile that is stabilized by fins, this looks different. A fin-stabilized projectile flies less well if it rotates too quickly. Now, one could think, well, that problem is easily solved. Just don't put fins on your projectiles, you don't need them when they are stabilized by spinning anyway. And indeed, the sabered round we have in steel armor, the M1392, is a spin-stabilized armor-piercing discarding saber, and stabilized by the gun's rifling, it doesn't have any fins. But of course, as you might expect, it's not quite that simple. Let's take a quick look at those saber rounds to explain. Now, other than the material the projectiles are made from, the two most important factors for the armor penetrating capabilities of the round are speed and the mass of the projectile, to focus as much kinetic energy as possible on a very small area. And while both weight and speed are important for that, speed is more important one of the two in this case. To get more speed out of anti-tank projectiles for that reason led to armor-piercing composite rigid rounds, as used in World War II for example, or still in use in smaller caliber guns. Such APCR rounds have a small armor-piercing core, made from hard metal, steel, tungsten or even depleted uranium, within a shell of lighter material, which provides the gas seal when it travels through the barrel. This way the projectile can be lighter and therefore gets accelerated to a higher speed within the barrel and has a higher muscle velocity. However, thanks to the soft metal shell surrounding the armor-penetrating core, the round still has a larger diameter, the diameter of the normal round that comes out of the barrel, resulting in more air resistance. And since, as we just established, the APCR round is lighter, that air resistance also have an easier time slowing it down again once it is out of the barrel, so the armor-piercing capability deteriorates very quickly with range. The British came up with a solution for this during World War II, the discarding Sabo. The Sabo, basically a shell around the armor-piercing core, provides a gas seal as the round accelerates in the barrel, as well as engaging the rifling of the barrel to get it to spin, as with the normal APCR round. But after it leaves the barrel, the Sabo falls off, and the smaller subcaliber core continues on its own, having now a smaller diameter and therefore less air resistance, so it can keep its speed up longer. 
this type of armor piercing discarding sable is what we have on the M60A1 in steel armor. As I've said, next to speed, a higher mass or weight is what gets you more armor penetration, if it is focused on a small area on impact. Now, making the core wider to add weight would increase air resistance again, counteracting the whole reason for having a discarding sable in the first place. However, if you want to add more mass to the armor piercing core to increase its kinetic energy on impact, what you can do is make it longer, like a dart or an arrow, adding mass to it without increasing its diameter or even reducing its diameter further to concentrate the energy on an even smaller area, leading to the typical arrow shape of modern sable rounds, which have greatly increased armor penetration. But spin stabilizing simply doesn't work anymore if a projectile gets too long, compared to its diameter. It needs fins to fly straight. And that is why the modern Sabre rounds, even those fired from rifled guns, are fin stabilized, not spin stabilized. And in that case, need a special drive band that isolates the round from the rifling to keep the spin down, making them more complicated again. A similar thing is true for heat rounds, which also are significantly more effective when they don't spin fast. As a result, heat rounds like the one we have in steel armor are also fin stabilized, not spin stabilized, which is a big reason why most modern tank guns are smooth bore. If your main anti tank rounds are all not supposed to spin anyway, might as well go for a cheaper smooth bore barrel. So, that's some info on the tank and its gun. Let's take a look at the crew stations of the M60A1 and how to work some of the gizmos you got to play with in it. Let's start with the driver's seat again. As with the T62 you can drive the tank directly from here. But while the T62 had two traditional steering levers to do it, the M60 has a steering wheel instead, and that difference is actually modeled in-game. While in the T62 you would select what lever to pull with the mouse, left mouse button for the left lever and right button for the right lever, and then pull the mouse back to pull the steering lever back, the desired distance, on the M60 you simply press either left or right mouse button to select the steering wheel and move the mouse left or right to rotate the steering wheel. You can also use the A and D keys, but you get more fine control when you do it properly. Other than that, you can turn the engine on and off and activate the smoke screen on the panel to the right of the tank. Now, this is the loader's position. There is little reason to be here other than to watch the crew work when you play in the M60. On the T62, the 50 cal machine gun is mounted on the loader's hatch, so you use it from the loader's position, but on the M60 it is mounted in the commander's cupola. If you hover over the ammo with your mouse, you can see the ammo supply left and what types of ammo you have, and that can be useful when you play with the UI turned off, which you can do. So, let's move on to the gunner's seat. From here you aim, obviously, the main 105mm gun as well as the coaxial 7.62mm machine gun. And in front of you you got the telescope to look outside as well as two gun sights, the primary one to be used in combination with the tank's rangefinder and a ballistic computer as well as a secondary with ranging and elevation scales you can use when the rangefinder or ballistic computer are out of action. We are looking at the main side at the moment, and as you can see it is a lot simpler than that of the T62, missing all the rangefinding and adjustable elevation scales. Though you can still do some rangefinding with the bars in the side if you really want to. Now, the main side's elevation is not fixed to the gun's elevation, since the gun's elevation is normally handled by the computer and you want it to be able to move up and down without affecting the side. So, the way that works is the gunner aims directly at the target he wants to engage. The commander looks in the coincidence rangefinder, which is coaxial to the gun's sight, so he sees what the gunner is looking at and sets the range to the target. We take another look at that when we go over to the commander's station. The range is automatically related to the ballistic computer, which in turn elevates the gun the necessary amount and the gunner can fire on the target. So, let's move on to the commander's station, which is located inside the triple cupola of the M60. The commander of course has binoculars to look around when he is turned out and do some range riding this way, as well as a periscope in front of him when he is turned in, and a sight to use the 50 caliber machine gun inside the cupola, so he can use the machine gun without having to turn out. This 50 caliber machine gun is not the otherwise in Western Army's omnipresent M2, but a M85 machine gun, which is smaller and was specifically designed to be installed inside vehicles, since the M2 would be too large to easily fit in a cupola like the one on the M60. The M85 machine gun was, however, very unreliable and not very successful, and pretty much disappeared again. 
Still, the gun can be used versus soft targets, versus infantry, and as air defense weapon versus low-flying aircraft or helicopters, though its effectiveness, especially versus aircraft, is not very high, as you can imagine. But if a hind is coming at you, it is better than nothing. The gun's rate of fire can also be adjusted between 500 rounds per minute for ground targets and 1000 rounds per minute for air targets. And then, of course, there is the rangefinder you got on the M60. The coincidence type rangefinder has two optics looking out the two typical small bulges on the side of the dirt of the M60 and earlier tanks in the baton line like the M48 and M47. It's nice to have something like this modeled in game, it is the first one I play where this is the case. So, let's take a quick look at its basic operation. Let's assume I want to fire a high explosive round through the window of the small hut in the distance over there. I am in the gunner's seat and the range is not yet adjusted, so when I do fire while aiming right at the window, the round obviously falls short. So, let's move over to the commander's seat now. The rangefinder is coaxial with the main side of the gunner and has the same reticle, but you get the picture from two optics, the two pictures being transferred via prisms to one eyepiece. The two pictures don't fully overlap, since they come from two different spots, and you have to adjust the range till they do overlap and you get the clear picture of the target. And once you do, voila, you have triangulated the range to the target. As you can see, I set the range to about 1400 meters, I get the clear overlapping picture of the target, so back to the gunner's seat. So, and when you fire again, straight through the window. I guess there is something to be said about that rifle barrel accuracy. A pity there is no co-op in this game, I think this game would be a lot of fun with one person as the gunner and one as the commander. Well, that is a basic overview of the crew positions on the M60. One last thing, just like the T62, the M60 has some night fighting capability, also active infrared. The M60A1 is equipped with a near-infrared searchlight next to the barrel, as well as near-infrared driving lights, and sights for the gunner, commander and driver to make use of them. The near-infrared lights illuminate the target and the IR sights can pick the IR light reflected up and turn them into a picture. Similar to how normal vision would work, but in a spectrum that is invisible to the naked eye. The range is limited of course, and one downside of this system is that being an active system, meaning that it is sending something out, in this case near-infrared light, it can be detected from further away than it can detect something itself by someone with the right equipment. Infrared is of course invisible to the human eye, but someone that has the same system you have can see your infrared lights from further away than he could see you otherwise. As is the case here, though it's hard to identify something just by the lights, so you have to be careful what you shoot at. Well, that's an overview of the M60A1 in steel armor. I figured I introduce the tank before I make videos of missions in it, which I hope I will do soon. The same goes for the T62, of course. Till then, this is it for this video. I hope it was informative. Thanks for watching, and maybe I'll see you next time.